What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football Channel. In this video, we're wrapping up the AFC North team outlooks. Again, I'm doing all 32 teams, every single one of them. If you're looking for a specific team or player, go to my channel, go on the search bar, type that team in, and within that video, you'll be able to find any player that's fantasy relevant. And guys, there are some times where I miss some things. If something happens a month after I make the video, obviously I'm going to miss out on some kind of analysis or, you know, I miss things here and there. I'm human, so take that for granted when you're yelling at me in the comment sections. But today we're rounding the AFC North out with the Cincinnati Bengals. If you miss any of the other three teams, they are my latest videos. So if you enjoy this video, make sure you scroll down and hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go check out the blog, go shop the store, all that good kind of stuff. Let's get into it. So we kick off the Bengals with Andy Dalton, the fire crotch rocket quarterback. I wrote about Andy Dalton in my top three quarterback sleepers blog post and video, which I'll link here if you haven't seen it. And basically what it came down to is Andy Dalton's had seasons where he's been really bad fantasy wise. He's had seasons where he's been really good. He was, I think, quarterback four a few years ago. Uh, a lot of it depends on his weapons. Well, for a lot of quarterbacks, that's the case. A lot of mediocre quarterbacks can do really good when they have their weapons and then vice versa. The story with him has been that his, his weapons are always injured. Take a look at last year, right? Geo, AJ Green, Tyler Eifert, none of them played more than 10 games for the season. When you lose all those weapons, it's very hard to produce big numbers, right? So a lot of this season is going to have to do with whether or not his weapons are ready to go. Now they've been using a lot of their early draft capital on weapons for Dalton. I guess to sure up the depth, make sure that if injuries occur, it's not a big deal. But there's two splits I really wanna look at when it comes to Dalton and his success. The one you're looking at right now is Andy Dalton with Tyler Eifert and without Tyler Eifert. As you know, and as you can see, Eifert's out a lot of the time, but the time that he is in, Andy Dalton is way, way better. He's an elite red zone target, right? You see his touchdowns go up by 0.6 per game. His fantasy points overall are an increase of about four fantasy points, so an extra touchdown or an extra 100 yards per game. A lot of his production comes when Tyler Eifert is in the lineup. Good news for Dalton, I guess, right now is the fact that Tyler Eifert, you know, he's recovering from back surgery. He had back surgery in December. Reports so far say he should be ready to go for camp, should be playing without limitations. I'm not sure if he's going to dive right into camp, but he should be ready for the season's opener. Next split I want to take a look at is Gio Bernard. So this is in split with Gio Bernard versus out of split. The point I'm trying to get across with this split is not that Dalton needs Gio Bernard. It's that he does way better with a pass catching back. Again, a full four points more per game with Gio in the lineup as opposed to without him in the lineup. Touchdowns went up, completions went up, passing yards went up. The fact of the matter is that they drafted Joe Mixon, who I'll get more in depth later in the video, who is an excellent pass catching back. Really, really, really good. Thus making Gio's talent redundant. So even if Gio's dealing with an injury or if Mixon's dealing with an injury, one of them is out, he still, no matter what, has a pass catching back back there and proven by the splits, that's something that he needs. If Eifert's healthy and he has a pass catching back in the backfield, I do believe that Dalton will have a big, big bounce back here. What's funny is uh, a lot of people, I mean, this isn't the argument whether or not A.J. Green is injury prone, but I looked at the splits when A.J. Green's playing versus when he's not, and Dalton has almost identical production with or without A.J. Green in the lineup. I think it's like one point less without A.J. Green in the lineup, but it's not really a big deal. So I would say the tight end, having Tyler Eifert there because, you know, he's such a good touchdown producer, and then having a pass uh, catching back is also big because uh, they do quick passes, a lot of dump offs and things like that. So what I'd say right now is when I started writing this article, he was going at pick like 160, quarterback 19 or 20, so a huge value. Right now, he's going at quarterback 16, 126 overall. I'll be honest, I'd be fine starting Andy Dalton in a 12-team league. They lost Andrew Whitworth, and they lost Kevin Zietler off their line. Their line's going to be bad. They're the 31st ranked line per pro football focus. They are going to need to rely on quick passes, short passes, dump offs if they want to run this passing attack successfully. I think the weapons that he has around him between AJ Green, Eifert, a mix of Geo and Mixon, as well as their two younger uh, wide receivers in Tyler Boyd and John Ross, hopefully he can be back soon. It, it's a good mix of weapons to be able to kind of fend off how bad their offensive line is going to be. Now I know, I know that's going to be his biggest fault or his biggest downside I could say this year is the fact that their offensive line is going to be bad. Both those guys were like Pro Bowl caliber 
players, especially Andrew Whitworth. So e even with those guys missing, I still think he has potential to be a top 10 fantasy quarterback this year, and he's one of my favorite late round guys. So I covered the weapons quickly, but we'll dive into, obviously, his all-pro, all-world wide receiver, A.J. Green. Green tore his hamstring last year in week 11, but he was an absolute savage prior to that. Last year, I remember before the draft started, A.J. Green was my number four overall ranked player on draft boards. A lot of people were like, that's a little too early. I still agree with what I was thinking. Before he left with his injury, he was leading the NFL in receiving yards as well as fantasy points for wide receivers. If you look at his target total through week 10, which was nine games, he suffered the injury in week 11, he was at 94. When you prorate that out to 16 games, that's 167 targets, which is one less than Mike Evans had last year, and he was the NFL league leader in targets. So the injury risk is, is definitely a little bit of a concern. He's missed eight games over the last three years. I don't think it's a, a crazy amount, but definitely there for sure. But his ceiling is as high as any wide receiver in fantasy, arguably with like Antonio Brown or something like that. But I love AJ Green. He will again be my fourth wide receiver off the board. I have him ahead of Mike Evans. I think I have Green the seventh or eighth overall, but I'm very high on Green again. When you look behind Green, right, they've used a lot of their early draft capital, like I said, on early picks. They use the number nine overall selection this year on a guy named John Ross. Kids out of Washington. You might know him as the fastest combine 40 yard dash ever. Ran a 4-2-2 at the combine, but he's a lot more than just a speedster. He's 5'11, 190 pounds. But he doesn't, he's not a slot guy. He played 90% of his routes on the outside when he played at Washington in college. A lot of experience there. Really good against coverage. Really good sure hands catching the ball. The only problem and the biggest concern is his injury history, right? Since college, throughout college, and now dealing with shoulder surgery, which he's still recovering from. All right, quick outfit change. My battery ran out as I was filming the last part of the video prior to this weekend, which was, I think, Friday or Thursday I was filming that. It's Tuesday morning, which is probably a good thing because we saw a few things surface this weekend from the Bengals camp in terms of Gio Bernard, in terms of John Ross. So the outlook's kind of changed over the weekend. So now I can kind of elaborate on that. I believe I left off talking about John Ross and how his injury history was concerned. He, he's still recovering from a shoulder surgery has been cleared for training camp and some videos surfaced of him running routes and you know catching balls at training camp here's a quick video of him they're saying he's still not 100 percent, so they're going to ease him into things he's not probably gonna be practicing in pads he's not going to be doing a lot of team drills but they'll slow him into the individual drills he looked good though. You could see that he's almost at full speed. He can do a lot of the things that he needs to do in order to get in shape. So he should be in pretty good shape within a few weeks. Hopefully he'll be 100% sooner rather than later. That being said, he's still, you know, he needs to get back on the field if he wants to really earn this first team spot if he wants to get those starter reps. Which is why it's very possible that Brandon LaFell opens the season as the starter on the outside. Right now, I don't know. I'd say it's probably 50-50 between Ross and LaFell just because Ross is obviously recovering from injury. He's definitely more talented than LaFell. LaFell's on the wrong side of 30, but he's been a steady, steady role player everywhere he's landed so far, right? Put up a 64, 8, 62, and 6 stat line last year as wide receiver 33 in fantasy. Very respectable for anyone, honestly, uh, that plays a role. Obviously, A.J. Green and Tyler Eifert and Gio were hurt. LaFell filled in pretty nicely. You know, he put up good numbers. If you look over the last few seasons, LaFell has averaged 58 catches, 777 yards, and over four touchdowns per season over the last three. So as I said, consistent role player can make the plays, can do everything you're asking him to do. Fill in as a number one, like we saw last year. He could play the number two. He could play the number three on, on sub-package -pack sets. So whatever the Bengals need him to do, that's what he's going to do. Again, those kind of numbers are going to be very hard to come by for LaFell with Green and Eifert and Geo and, and Mixon and, and John Ross all back in the mix, right? What I would say is I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the season, LaFell and John Ross are around the same category in terms of numbers, stat lines, right? Like I can see both of them putting up somewhere from like 50 to 55 catches, 550 to 600 yards, um, and then four or five scores. Right now, John Ross is the 150th player off the board, wide receiver 59. LaFell is 252nd off the board, like wide receiver 85. So in any kind of long-term league, you're obviously looking at Ross as a top 10 talent. You want him on your team because he has a lot of upside. He could be playing opposite AJ Green for a long time in this offense. LaFell has more value in a redraft league, depending on how the rest of camp goes. If he does win that starter job, then he could put up decent numbers for you, like wide receiver four numbers. Uh, but Ross is pretty much the play here. I do say that 
Tyler Boyd going ahead of Brandon LaFell in drafts is ridiculous. Tyler Boyd was their second round pick the year prior to Ross. He ran 90%, almost 90% of his snaps as per Evan Silva from the slot last year, which is a spot he'll definitely play again this year. So last year, without AJ Green, without Tyler Eifert, you know, you would expect a bigger year from Tyler Boyd. Came in and a lot of people were excited about him. They thought he was talented. They thought he was going to put up some numbers in this offense. Did not happen. He averaged just over 37 receiving yards a game. He played in all 16 games, 54 catches, just around 600 yards, and scored one time. Like I said, Boyd is going off the board before LaFell. Two 18th overalls, at like wide receiver 75, 77 in that area. Those two ADPs need to switch. He's the last of the three wide receivers I would want in Cincinnati. The last guy I want to talk about in terms of weapons on the outside is this kid, Josh Malone. He was their fourth round pick out of Tennessee this year. Uh, he's 21 years old, receiving a lot of buzz in camp this offseason. 6'3", 210 pounds, so really good size. 4-4 speed. In terms of weight adjusted speed score, he's in the 94th percentile. If you guys are ever looking for, you know, like spark scores and, and percentile kind of scores, go to playerprofiler.com. You can find basically all the NFL players and, and where they rank among other players and, and that kind of stuff. So he, he was an excellent downfield threat for the volunteers while he was there. He averaged like 19.4 yards per catch during his uh, 2016 junior season. He's received a lot of hype this offseason from dudes like A.J. Green, John Ross, wide receivers coach James Urban. A.J. Green said that Malone reminds him of a young Marvin Jones. And remember, A.J. Green and Marvin Jones played together in Cincinnati when before Jones went over to the Lions. Wide receiver coach said the kid has real ability and that he's a big and he's fast and he has a good natural fear for the game. He's learning how to run our routes. John Ross, the other rookie, they both came in together. He praised Malone, adding to be his height and run as well as he does and catch the ball as well as he does. I think he's got a really bright future. He's definitely a long shot to contribute, but anytime you see a collectiveness of you know, positive quotes, especially from guys that are hanging around him and running all the uh, the drills with him and doing all this stuff with him, it's someone to keep an eye on. Probably not going to get any time in 2017 just because he has a lot of people ahead of him uh, but someone to monitor in dynasty leagues brings us to tyler eifert they're pro bowl tight end most of us know the story here right now he's going off the board 75th overall tight end six which is absolutely a steal uh, you could easily argue you know eifert into the same tier as the greg olsons as long as he can have a full bill of health going into this season you know he missed the first six games of 2016 which sucked for people who drafted him because he didn't really know what was going to happen in that situation. Ended up missing a lot more time than we expected. Then he underwent back surgery in December. And he finished the season with eight games overall on his resume. So another shortened season for Eifert. It's been the story of his career. Over the last three seasons, he's only played in 22 of a possible 48 games. But all indications are that he's healthy, he's ready to go, he will be a full participant in training camp, which is true because he was on the field and he's he's been medically cleared by doctors for training camp. We'll have to see if they ease him back into anything. But you know, here's the thing: when when training camp starts and you're medically cleared, that's you know that's a good thing. When you guys when you have guys like they're teetering right, and you're like, oh, they should be ready for the start of the season. That's where you have to start worrying because if you're not in training camp a month, two months prior to the season starting, then you know you're cutting it really close. But if you're full go for training camp, which is a month prior, then you have plenty of time to acclimate yourself, to get in shape, to to get a feel for the game, which is what I like about Eifert this year. He should be ready to go. Eifert's an elite touchdown scorer, scored 18 times in his previous 21 games, which was over the last two seasons. He has a red zone target share of 34.4% last year, 26% in 2015. So he's Dalton's favorite target bar none when they're near the goal line. He's got double digit upside easily. We saw that he has he had 13 touchdowns two years ago. He was on pace to have another double digit year last year had he played the full 16 games. So, you know, at pick 75, what you could do is that that's like an eighth round pick in 10 team leagues. So take someone like him and then you still have guys like Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle, or even Austin Hooper that you can get five or six rounds later. In case something does happen to Eifert, you have plenty of backup because there's depth at the tight end position. And then behind Eifert on the depth chart there is CJ Uzuma. I'm not even sure to say that. Not a great receiving factor. He caught 25 passes in 10 games while Eifert was out last year. I don't even know why I'm really mentioning him, to be honest with you. Let's move on to the running backs. This is, this is the juicy stuff. And a few general facts to get into before we actually hit the backfield. This is Cincinnati's, as a team, their rush attempts rank since 2013 in terms of volume, in terms of just rushing attempts. Eighth in the NFL, fifth, seventh, ninth. 
So over the last four years, top 10 every single year in rush attempts. Now going into the season, like I mentioned, they lost two Pro Bowl caliber players on their line and Andrew Whitworth and Kevin Zietler. And now they are ranked 31st in the NFL in terms of pro football focus rankings. Okay, so of course we start with Joe Mixon. 48th overall pick in the 2017 NFL Draft out of Oklahoma. I'm not going to go into the off-field issues because no one doesn't matter in fantasy football. He is easily the most talented back in this backfield, if not the entire rookie class. If not, we'll stick to that for now. He's 6'1", 225, runs a 4'4", 340 yard dash. 91st percentile for weight adjusted speed score. Um, while he's an outstanding runner, right? His athleticism is off the charts for any level, NCAA, NFL. I would say that Mixon is like the premier receiving back in this class, but coming out with McCaffrey, I, I think it's like 1A, 1B, to be honest with you. They're both very natural in their receiving ability, very easily, you know, catch balls, one-handed catches, over the middle, screen passes, dump offs. They're both just very, very athletic and can make those plays without a problem. Mixon has that breakaway home run speed if he needs it. He has the size and the power to, you know, lower his head and run guys over for those consistent five, seven, ten yard runs. He could run in between the 20s. He could run it on the goal line. He's got everything you need in a premier feature back. He's really got nothing but praise this offseason, saying he's looking like a beast. His acceleration and speed have stood out. Marvin Lewis, their head coach. Off the charts, talents-wise, big, fast, catch, run, can see, smart, and he's 20 years old. He's as smart as a whip. I'm not sure what the fuck that expression means, as smart as a whip, but we'll assume it's a good thing following all those other stuff. So, you know, with Jeremy Hill imploding over the last two seasons, Gio Bernard is working back from an injury. There's a good chance that Mixon, you know, gets a stranglehold over a lot of the work in this backfield entering the year. Right now, he's going off the board, ADP 33 overall, running back 14. I'm not going to own him in every league. I do think it's it's a little bit of a, it's not a reach, uh, but in terms of the risk level, just in terms of the crowded backfield, you don't really know if he's going to get that workhorse ability. I think his ADP is going to fall a little bit at following the videos that came out of Gio Bernard over this weekend, showing him at full health and him looking pretty good. Um, but I'm definitely willing to roll the dice in a few of my leagues because this kid really has that top five fantasy upside. You know, he has that Le'Veon Bell, Adrian Peterson in his prime. He has that kind of ability. That's what Joe Mixon brings to the field. And if they give him the opportunity, I have no doubt in my mind that he will come away with that. So, you know, like a month or so ago, reports came out about Gio Bernard that, you know, he might miss the first couple games of the regular season coming back from an ACL tear last year, uh, which really made his ADP, absolutely, he, you know, he, he's almost like going undrafted now in leagues. People just forgot about him. Then these videos surfaced of him this weekend at practice showing him moving through the heavy bags. Like he, he looked really good. He looked like he had never had an injury. So he's cutting, he's moving without restriction. He looks really, really good. So it's safe to say Gio is fully ready, fully back to go. His ADP in just like two or three days jumped from the 170s down to 150. It'll probably keep improving. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it hit like the 120s. My thing is, Gio, you know, Gio's proven to be versatile. He's proven to be very useful for this Bengals since he's come into the NFL. They appreciate the continuity and they know that they could trust Gio. They know that he's someone that can do a lot of different things for this team. So you can't just write off Gio. You can't just assume he's not going to get any touches now with Mixon in the mix. Since he's came in the league in 2013, he's averaged 14 touches a game. It was, uh, let me see, 10.4 carries, 3.6 receptions. With the loss of the two linemen, Zietler and um, Whitworth, it, it's very likely that this, this offense looks to utilize quick passes, looks to dump off screens, things like that, which definitely plays into Gio's favor. But at the same time, I think between Gio and Mixon, the talent or the skill set is kind of redundant there. Uh, since they're both such good receivers, Gio's usage from that ten and a half and three and a half, you know, catch and carries uh, numbers should dip down a little bit. I still think he'll see somewhere between six to eight carries a game, and still should get three to four targets or receptions a game. Um, so he's definitely not going to be unutilized. It should be scaled back as long as Mixon can get every opportunity that he deserves. There, you're obviously not getting the ceiling uh, on Gio because even if like. Even if Mixon went down with an injury, Jeremy Hill is still going to step up and be a part of that uh, committee there, right? You'll never get Gio as a fully featured back 
which is why it's like you're getting a little bit of a floor there out of Gio because he's still going to get his touches, but there's no ceiling there, which is why I think him at an ADP like past 100 is probably the right thing in the fantasy community. And of course, you know, we have Jeremy Hill. So Hill's been pretty terrible over the last few years outside of like goal line carries. He's averaged a little over 3.6 yards per carry over the last two years. 69th ranked among running backs in yards after contact per touch. 0.7 as per player profiler. You know, entering is this is going to be his contract year, so it makes sense that they drafted Mixon because they're probably going to be able, they're probably going to be looking to move on from Jeremy Hill following the 2017 season. Jeff Hobson of the Bengals official website still expects Jeremy Hill to be a factor on offense for Cincinnati this season. I can't imagine it being anything more than short yardage work or goal line work, considering how effective he's been over the last few years. Hill scored. 29 touchdowns in the last three years. Those are three years in the NFL. 29 touchdowns, almost 10 a year. 20 of those 29 came from inside the five yard line. So you can see how much work he has. Now you could take this one of two ways. You could say Mixon here is now going to get all that work. So now that touchdown upside is huge for him. Or you could say, you know, it's one of those like if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of things. Now, I don't see like, you know, if they're cruising down the field and Mixon's on the field and they go from like the 30 to the 50 to the 30 to the 20 to the 10 to the 5, they're just going to be like, okay, let's hold up. Mixon, come out of the game. Jeremy Hill, come in the game. I don't see them like going out of their way to put Jeremy Hill in the game. But if things slow down, I wouldn't be surprised if they threw Hill in to do a lot of these goal line rushes considering how he's been very effective over the last few years doing so. Listen, I, I agree with the people who say that Hill's, I mean, uh, Mixon's talent is like out of this world, right? Like I said, I've been preaching in all video. Like I love this kid. I think he's a dynamite talent, but I think it's kind of naive to expect him to just get all the work considering how crowded the backfield is already and how the other two players in the backfield with them have their specific skill set, right? If, if it was like a situation where Mixon is just overtaking a, a backfield where like the guys behind him kind of like, you know, they're just like, okay, running backs and, and he's just better all around than them. I'd say, okay, but Gio is like, his skill set is the pass catching back. Hills is short yardage work. So it, you know, they both have their niche, their niche players. So I would see them being utilized in their kind of like niche setting if that makes sense in a fantasy football way but Hill's going off the board where Gio was around the 170s I'm I, I'm definitely not even coming close to touching Jeremy Hill anywhere in, in fantasy Hill I, I don't know if I'm gonna own Hill anywhere I mean uh Gio anywhere but but I will be owning some mixing shares for sure because of the upside there so that's gonna wrap up the Bengals team outlook if you enjoyed the video, just scroll down a little bit hit that thumbs up button all right I got a question for you guys AJ Green Joe Mixon, Tyler Eifert. Those three, we're going to play fuck Chuck Mary. Or no, we're going to play keep, trade, cut. But tight ends get 1.5 PPR, wide receivers 1 PPR, and running backs 0.5 PPR. Keep, trade, cut. You get to do one of each for Joe Mixon, AJ Green, Tyler Eifert. 1.5 PPR for tight ends, 1 for wide receivers, 0.5 for running backs. I want to hear your answer. Later. Later.